Good afternoon, everyone. I am Stephanie Bailey. I'm the Education Program Manager and Preservation Consultant at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. Welcome to the November webinar, When to Call a Conservator. This webinar is part of the Regional Heritage Stewardship Program, which we call RHSP for short, the Intermountain West Region. And this initiative is a partnership between the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts and the Utah Division of Arts and Museums and the Utah Humanities. I should say thank you to the National Endowment for the Humanities for funding this partnership and this webinar. Our expert presenter today is Robin Haney. Hi, Robin. Hey, everyone. Robin is the now is the <laughs> registrar and head of collections at Colorado College. Congratulations, Robin, on your new position. Thank you. She today for us will address what services are offered for the care and treatment of collections items. Additionally, Robin is going to discuss how to identify and prioritize conservation concerns, which is oftentimes a challenge for collections with many and varied objects. She's going to address how to find resources, seek funding, and document this entire process. So Robin, I'm going to just go ahead and turn the webinar over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Stephanie. I'm really excited to talk to everyone and talk a little bit more about uh, when to call a conservator and kind of some approaches you can and should be taking with your collection, but um, when you can kind of reach out for, for expert help and um, some guidelines on how to prioritize and think about these issues. Um, so, like Stephanie said, my name is Robin. I am actually an objects conservator um, by training, although my last, I guess, eight years have kind of um, centered around collections care more broadly and more administrative um, tasks with collections. Um, so thinking about collections as a whole and how to prioritize care uh, has been a main focus in a lot of what I've been doing. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, with some terminology and kind of some uh, overview of principles, which I'm sure will be familiar to a lot of you, but it never hurts to kind of talk through uh, again. Um, obviously, starting out with what conservation is and, uh, you know, the American Institute for Conservation, which is the professional um, organization professional governing body in the United States. So they have a definition here um, of what conservation is and what conservation means. And they really uh, qualify it as all the actions taken towards long-term preservation of cultural heritage. Um, so balancing preservation and access is a big part of conservation, um, but it includes not only physical hands-on work on an object like you see in this image here, um, but also uh, how you care for your object. So preventive tasks, um, examination, documentation, treatment, uh, you can see, broadly speaking, people tend to split um, conservation uh, into two categories. So they'll talk about preventive conservation or um, versus conservation or remedial conservation. Uh, so preventive conservation really focuses on an object's environment and storage conditions um, and display conditions uh, as a way of preventing and addressing deterioration. Um, you'll see here in the image there are collections objects that are wrapped in a, um, a film that's designed to protect against corrosion, uh, stored in a storage housing. And then on the right, you'll see an example of remedial conservation where actually a conservator is working under a microscope to, um, to treat an object hands-on. Uh, so an action taken directly to an object. Broadly speaking though, I like to think of conservation as a way to mitigate change over time because uh, as we all know, our collections are constantly changing. Unfortunately, um, nothing exists in a vacuum, and even when something's brought into a museum or a uh, collections environment, that doesn't mean that uh, change stops. Um, and so really what we try to do is control change over time and um, figure out how to make our objects last as long as possible for the benefit of as many people as possible. Okay, again, so probably most of you are familiar um, with these things, the agents of deterioration, classic uh, collection care principles, um, and these are what cause change to our objects over time. Um, so we're going to kind of talk about a few of these today uh, in terms of uh, what you can do and should be doing to maintain your collection and, um, and then what, you know, you should leave to a professional conservator. So we're going to really focus on pests. Um, uh, we're not going to talk about integrated pest management, but we're going to talk about pests in the context of um, noticing damage and, and reaching out for help. 
we're going to talk about pollutants, um, specifically dust. I'm going to spend kind of a lot of time um, talking about thinking about cleaning uh, and dusting your collections objects as a way of regular maintenance and something you should be doing. Uh, and then we're going to talk about custodial neglect and dissociation. So um, again, with with cleaning and caring for your collection in that way, um, nodding a, not preventing uh, deterioration before remedial conservation is necessary is one of the best ways you can actually, um, one of the best tools you can use to mitigate the need for a conservator and to um, really have a cost effective way of caring for your collection. Um, and I'm including in custodial neglect, not undertaking regular housekeeping in your collection spaces and, and amongst your collection objects. Um, again, so these agents of deterioration are uh, kind of an industry-wide thing, but if you want more information, the Canadian Conservation Institute has a really great web page, and I put the link there for you, um, but you can Google it and it'll pop up. Um, okay, so how do you know when your objects are changing? and How do you know uh, when there are changes that might need to be addressed by a conservator? Um, so one of the key tools for that are obviously condition reports. Um, these have a variety of purposes, right? So you do condition reports if you have objects coming in or out of, uh, of your organization on loan. Hopefully uh, you'll do condition reports every time you accession an object. Um, in the real world, in most museums, it's not actually, um, typically there's not a lot of uh, historic, well, I shouldn't say that. In some institutions, you might have a lot of historic condition reports, but not everywhere has that. Um, and so I like to be opportunistic and every time uh, I pull an object for another reason, if it doesn't have a baseline condition report, I take the opportunity to um, do at least a brief condition report. Uh, there's a recent publication by the Southeast Registrar Association, um, Basic Condition Reporting Handbook. And this is a really useful uh, guide in helping set up condition reports that has sample um, Sample reports for a variety of different materials. It breaks down different material types and uh, ways to describe how they're changing. Um, it gives you a lot of good glossaries for terminology. Um, it's really nice in your condition reporting to try to develop a standardized terminology that you're using to describe your objects. Uh, it helps to have consistent condition reporting so you can rely on that information and it helps with prioritization later down the line um, when you're trying to work through your collection and establish your treatment priorities. Um, so developing that good baseline right off the bat becomes really uh, important. And this book is a useful tool because it does help you establish a standardized um, format for your reports and standardized um, terminology to use. Uh, another really great resource for describing condition because uh, it's easy to get bogged down in terminology, but it, again, it's really nice if you can be consistent. Um, the Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Material has developed a visual glossary, which is a really nice tool because you can um, go through and find the term that you think is appropriate to the, the um, damage you're seeing. And then you can confirm that it is, you know, what you're actually meaning to call an object. So uh, more than just a, a written glossary that you have to read and kind of interpret, it has actual illustrations of a variety of different um, damage terminology. So I find that a very useful resource um, and it's, it's nice that it's available on the web. Um, so another thing that's really useful in knowing when your objects are changing is uh, observing them during regular housekeeping. So I'm going to I'm going to emphasize housekeeping um, quite a bit here and what I mean by that is the routine cleaning of both your uh, collection spaces um, your storage areas and your display areas. So uh, an example of this is on um, this ceramic, this ancient Greek ceramic that was on view at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts um, for several years. We had a, a work study student actually undertaking gallery maintenance for us. So she was cleaning vitrines in the galleries and she noticed some crystalline growth on the inside of the um, mouth of the ceramic. So you can kind of see that white powdery stuff on the inside of the rim there. Um, it's subtle and it's inside the ceramic where most of us don't look uh, on any given day. Um, and it was really due to her uh, regular, just kind of cleaning the collections that she noticed um, that this object had a, a serious condition issue. Um, so we were able to pull this object off of view and clean it and remove the um, escalation. And unfortunately, 
uh, it actually went away for quite a while until we could um, find funds to build a metal display case instead of a wooden um, case that allowed kind of this deterioration to happen. None of this would have been spotted and, unless she hadn't, unless she had been in the galleries regularly, um, and it could have led to significant damage and uh, kind of the surface starting to fall or pop off. Um, to that end, it's really important that you have a housekeeping plan. So a good housekeeping plan um, should be written out and should be part of your day-to-day -day collection management um, approach. Uh, you want it to address both storage and display areas, so lay out what needs to be maintained, who is responsible for housekeeping and, and gallery maintenance, so whether it's staff, volunteers, work studies, um, whoever you have at your disposal who can be trained to do these tasks regularly, um, it should be listed in this housekeeping plan. Uh, the housekeeping plan should also describe the methods used for housekeeping. So in addition to training, um, they should have this document as a backup kind of extra resource to go back and refer to um, as, as needed. Um, and then it should describe the regular schedule for housekeeping activities. So how often do storage areas get cleaned? How often do galleries get cleaned? Um, how often do the tops of vitrines versus the sides of vitrines get cleaned? You know, do you vacuum your baseboards regularly? All that sort of thing should be written down. Um, and of course, as with everything in collections work, it should be realistic and achievable. So it might not be uh, the ideal and what you would, um, you know, want in an ideal world, but it should be something that you can do with your current capacity in terms of your staff and volunteers uh, and people who could do this, this work. Um, so how often, this is a question I get asked a lot, how often should I do housekeeping? And this is really context driven. So it depends on your uh, HVAC system. It depends on if you have good filters that are keeping pollutants out of your spaces. It depends on if you have covered storage areas, if your objects are in vitrines, or if your objects are out uh, on open display. So it, it's really kind of context driven and you'll need to get a picture of that over time by careful observation. So, um, it's useful if you can kind of set up a routine schedule. I'm gonna check my galleries once a week or I'm gonna check my galleries and storage once a month. And then you'll start to develop an idea of how often you should be actually in your spaces um, maintaining uh, your cleaning um, schedule. And, and really, it doesn't have to be everything every time. You know, you could say, I'm going to vacuum once a week and then we'll dust the tops of vitrines once a month. And then once a quarter, we will take out all the carpets and vacuum them elsewhere, things like that, um, if you have rugs in your entryways. Uh, it, it should be layered and leveled um, according to your organization. Uh, another really great tool um, to use for preventing change over time or mitigating change over time is, is employing preventive conservation techniques. So, um, Again, I'm going to, another thing I'm going to stress repeatedly through this is that uh, it's really important to carefully observe your objects in your collection spaces. So you want to watch, um, watch what's going on because that helps you understand what agents of deterioration are actually critical for your objects. You know, you might be in a historic house with windows um, and light very uh, important or um, a, a very big threat to your collection. Or you might be in a space that doesn't have, you know, HEPA filters on your HVAC and you'll notice a lot of uh, dust and pollutant build up. Uh, one of the things that um, the object on the top here uh, was subject to was a lot of repeated handling to see uh, in its old box what it was and if it was, uh, you know, the certain ceramic in this way, adding that little screen made it so that the object didn't have to be handled and taken in and out of its storage mount over time. Um, it's always best, uh, I can't stress this enough, it's always best to change your object's environment before you try to change your object itself. Um, if you can address the agent of deterioration that's affecting your object, in the long run, generally it's more cost effective uh, and it's better for the object. Um, so I do want to talk about cleaning collections objects a little bit because again, it's an important element of collections management. Um, and I'm, I'm mostly talking about uh, cleaning dust buildup from general day-to-day -day museum life. Um, but it's also an irreversible conservation treatment. So uh, you might not consider that when you're using a microfiber to wipe down a, an object or a piece of furniture on display. Um, but any, any cleaning is actually um, conservation. And if 
you are uh, overzealous in your cleaning or if you are using techniques that are not appropriate for your objects, um, not only can you seriously damage your object, but you can de decrease its value significantly and also um, prevent any research applications that may have been possible um, because you've removed material from the surface. It also puts you in danger. Uh, so I know this is, you know, uh, I guess the common understanding of this is that natural history collections are, you know, significantly um, at risk uh, to have objects been treated by heavy metals and toxic substances in the past. But I think that's true of any um, kind of organic collections from the early 20th century, early to mid 20th century. Uh, we here at the Colorado Springs Fine Art Center have an art-based collection and um, a large portion of our collection is treated with arsenic um, as a pest uh, deterrent in the 30s and 40s. So um, cleaning is, is a time where you might, uh, you know, obviously handling those objects is uh, risky, but cleaning when you're actually removing or, or kicking up stuff on the surface um, is, is pretty risky for you. and um, so if you don't know the history of your objects, you don't know whether or not they've been treated, it's not worth attempting um, to, to do any sort of in your dusting. And generally, before you uh, do any sort of action to your object, uh, I like to um, consider a series of questions. And these were actually laid out by the Victorian Albert Museum Conservation Department. Um, it's kind of their ethical guidelines. Uh, it's not the full document, which is available online, but it's um, some that are particularly pertinent for, for doing even regular uh, collections maintenance or collections-based tasks. Um, and it's, it's a nice way to kind of understand your own motives for what, doing what you're doing. Uh, it's easy to get drawn into um, other people's motives or other people's potential um, wants for your collection, especially in terms of aesthetics. Um, but really understanding why you're doing what you're doing is critical before you uh, do anything or work at all on an object. So, or even request, you know, uh, to work with a conservator. They're going to want to know why you want to do what you need, what you're asking for, um, and and the context around your request. Um, so the first thing that you always want to talk or think about is why is any action needed? Um, is it needed because the object's in danger? Is it needed because the object's uh, structurally, uh, you know, um, at risk. Is it needed for aesthetic reasons? Um, is it needed for research potential? Uh, you know, really understanding your motives. What are your options for action? So uh, is it necessary, like I said, to do something to the object or can you change the object's environment? Um, do you have sufficient information and skill to assess and implement actions? So again, if uh, you're attempting to, you know, clean or do something to an object yourself. This is one to really, really think about. Um, and even conservators will think about this and will tell you whether or not it's something that's within their um, abilities. And then how will your, your actions affect subsequent actions? So I talked about this a little bit in terms of cleaning, but anything you do to an object will affect future work on that object or future use and research uh, of that object. So it's an important thing to consider um, when you're actually thinking about any uh, any work being done on your object, whether you're doing it or someone else is doing it. Um, and then again, can the object, can the environment or use be adapted instead of intervening on the object? This is a really critical one. Um, and then the other two are also important, again, for future work with the collection. Um, so will your actions be fully documented to a known and accepted standard? Um, and that, again, includes condition reporting. So are you uh, condition reporting in an appropriate way and are those condition reports um, being stored somewhere uh, so are they part of your database are they part of your typical um, collections file how are you recording those where are they going where do they live and will they be accessible um, in the future so making sure that those are attached to an object record they're placed in an object file um, and that you're recording all of the information that you need to report is a critical component uh, so in the context of dusting, I wanted to talk a little bit about dirt um, and dust. So dust is made up of lots of different things that um, kind of fall from, from humans, so hair and skin and textile uh, components. There's also things that are kicked up from the ground, sand and minerals, et cetera, um, things, pollutants that come in through your HVAC um, that can include, you know, car exhaust and other sorts of um, kind of 
gross chemicals. Um, dust particles can be quite sharp because of some of those sand and mineral elements. Uh, and dust also likes to absorb water over time. So as dust accumulates on the surface of an object, it will start to uh, pull in moisture from the air and stick to itself and stick to your object. So that's why, um, why I'm kind of talking about cleaning as something that perhaps you should be thinking about doing to your collection. Um, just because you don't want dust buildup over time, I would indicate, or I would, I would lump that in with custodial neglect. Um, and really uh, something you want to avoid because once dust starts to stick to an object, it's difficult to remove and you will need a conservator's help, um, which again, is not the most cost-effective way to address this issue. Um, so dirt on your objects can also be significant. Uh, so this is two images. One, the one on the left is dust buildup on frames, uh, framed 2D works in the collection storage area of the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, which is where I worked until just recently. Um, so a lot of these slides are pulled from there uh, versus, um, you know, so, some, something that looks quite dirty. So the object on the right, the bowl on the right, it looks like it has a lot of uh, dirt buildup, but that's actually um, crude residue inside an ancient bowl. Um, which could be analyzed and, and studied by archaeologists. So, um, so the dirt and, and soiling on an object surface can be quite significant, uh, both to their context. So you also have an object that um, is dirty from a particular event that's also significant. So, so understanding what you're looking at and recording that, and then again, questioning your motives as to why you want to address what you're trying to address. Um, we can learn other things from dirt too. So uh, by keeping an eye on our collections and, and seeing where dust is building up, we can both see what our vulnerable objects are to, um, you know, to, to dust build up, to interaction with humans. Um, we can also learn how effective our gallery maintenance plan is and our HVAC filters. Um, and then we can adjust our, our schedules there. So either doing increased cleanings or increased filter changes, things like that. Um, we can learn about whether or not we have pest issues. Um, and pests are, are really interesting because you can learn um, a lot from the frass they leave behind, which is actually the insect poop. And uh, you can see an image on the right here. Um, this is uh, from David Pinager's uh, book on pest management, which is great. And it really um, shows magnified views of insect frass. And um, by <laughs> looking at the shape and size of the frass, uh, you can actually tell what kind of bug you have, um, which is great in how you want to address uh, treating it. Um, and then again, dirt can sometimes give you insight into the object's history and use. Uh, so it can actually be a really uh, interesting tool to learn more about your collection and also to learn more about your uh, collection management protocols and how well those are working. Um, so if you are going to attempt to remove dust from your objects and do light cleaning, uh, again, I want to stress how important it is that you examine your object, object document your object, and assess um, uh, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, so again, undertaking condition reports, uh, writing those down, and then keeping track of those in your creator collections database or collection management system, or even your just your object files uh, is really important. Uh, and there's some things to look out for that um, that would make you want to stop and, and perhaps not address an object at all. So you want to look for old repairs um, or areas of weakness in your object. And these are uh, red flags also for handling. Um, things you want to be careful of when you see them, no matter what you're doing to your object. Um, so old repairs can be very obvious or very subtle. Uh, it really kind of depends. You want to look for fragile surfaces. So, so you'll see this image on the left. We have a frame um, that has an actively flaking surface decoration. Um, that's obviously something you wouldn't want to uh, you wouldn't want to handle, honestly. Um, and you definitely wouldn't want to attempt to clean it. On the right, we have a ceramic, an ancestral pueblo um, bowl that has uh, red pigment red ochre pigment that's um, that's fugitive and not much is remaining. And so it's hard to distinguish. Um, but that is even there, but that is something that you would definitely not want to remove from the surface um, because it's an indication of how it was made and how it once appeared. Um, so you want to, again, carefully observe before you would attempt to do anything. And it's nice to have these, these things documented in your object record for the future. Um, and then, you know, you can uh, know that you need work on, on, on your objects. 
Um, you also want to look for things that are evidence of use. So in this, this object, you'll see a corn offering uh, that might be mistaken for kind of just general buildup of stuff, um, but actually was uh, an offering when this object is used and an important part of the object itself. Um, Excuse me. Uh, and then another big one is looking for signs of pest activity. Um, so this is a pretty obvious case here. It's not always quite this clear. Um, and you'll see in the bottom of the uh, wrapping on this object, lots of little powdery uh, dust looking stuff. So that's probably wood particles and also um, frass, which could be then put under the microscope uh, and, and used to determine what sort of insect you have. Um, but this is, uh, a, a definite candidate for conservation um, and something that you want to reach out for help with. Uh, before you would want to clean an object, you'd obviously want a nice space. Even for examining your objects, you always want to have um, good light and magnification available. I always like to work on a, a white surface, clean white surface. Um, that helps me know when I uh, have, you know, made that surface dirty and it's no longer good for keeping objects on. Um, depending on the object, I will use, you know, clean Tyvek over some epifoam padding, or I'll just use plain blotter paper if it's something that's not super stable that I don't want on a, a wobbly surface. Um, you'll see a couple of really great tools on the right, you know, obviously magnification, um, and the top thing's called an optivizer, and that you can wear on your head and keep your hands free while you're looking at an object. So this is a great setup. Um, for condition reporting and for examining objects, uh, you can set up a similar situation on a cart. Um, so you can so you can work in collection spaces and storage or um, in your galleries. Uh, works really well. You also want to prayer yourself. Again, this is kind of um, basic to handling objects, but you want to wear personal protective equipment. Um, so gloves are are critical, and uh, I always use nitrile gloves. I have very strong opinions on gloves. I know there's a lot of different theories, um, but cotton gloves tend to lose their shape and pick up and accumulate dirt. So uh, nitrile, dirt, nitrile gloves are nice because um, you can dispose of them when they get dirty. They mold really well to your hands. You have good tactile sense when you're working with objects. Um, and generally, um, they don't get used to the point where you're transferring dirt from one object to another. Uh, you also, if you're working in storage uh, and you have a lot of dust, in your collection space, you might want to use a mask and or a respirator. Um, the thing, the key with masks and respirators, even the uh, simple dust mask, it's really important to get them fit tested before you use them. Um, it's kind of a critical component of health and safety and it really allows you to um, protect yourself and make sure you're using the tool in the right sort of way. Uh, I'm gonna pause here for a minute and just check in on the chat. I'm not seeing anything and I don't know if that's right but I'll check in again on the uh, at the end of the webinar and see if there are any questions um, okay moving along so helpful tools uh, when you're doing regular collections maintenance so a good vacuum and what I mean by a good vacuum is not a super powerful vacuum uh, actually a vacuum that uses a HEPA filter so HEPA is uh, going to filter out the smallest particles um, that it's possible to filter out, and, and a vacuum that has um, variable suction. So there are vacuums that are top of the line that are a few thousand dollars um, that have really nice styleable uh, suction. Um, this Mila vacuum runs around $600 and it has a HEPA filter and it also has, I think, six uh, variable suction settings. So you can set it on a lower um, suction, which is what I always like to use when I'm working with collections objects. And down below it, you'll see some micro tools. So you can get very small tools, um, which are useful when you're, say, dusting a frame, uh, something like that. You'll also see in that image um, some mesh. And uh, again, so when you're, if you're um, dusting a, a, an object using a brush uh, and, and brushing it towards vacuum, um, you'll want to have your vacuum nozzle covered with mesh just in case something does get dislodged uh, so you can collect it. Um, up on the right hand side, there are a lot of uh, different brushes. Uh, natural hair brushes are great. You can see one of them looks like it's been used a little too much uh, and it's still kind of dirty from cleaning. Um, and the bottom image is that same pot, that same ceramic that we saw earlier, um, and having the 
salt was removed from the surface uh, once it came off of you. We were actually fortunate enough to be able to do some uh, scientific analysis of our, our crystals, uh, which kind of indicated that the materials used in the casework were the problem um, and were causing these salts to form on the surface. Um, and so we were able, once we figured that out, to remove the crystals and keep the object in uh, a better display or a better storage case until we bought a better display case. Okay, um, so you don't want to dust an object if the object doesn't need it. So there are lots of reasons an object may look dirty and a lot of them have nothing to do with dust on the surface. So if you have a really good HVAC system, if you have um, pretty good protocols in place for cleaning, um, you're less likely to need to actually do anything to your object surface. So uh, you probably don't need to dust uh, unless you know that you have spaces that tend to build up dust and that don't get um, cleaned or seen to as frequently. Um, if you've noticed any of the different uh, kind of red flag issues that we just went through, um, the object is unstable, unstable or fragile in any way. Um, that's another another point in time to stop and not work on your object. Um, if you don't know the source of what you're trying to remove, again, so if it's not just dust buildup um, uh, and you don't know what the soil, what the soil came from, I would not proceed further um, in removing anything on that surface. If an object is moldy, um, that is actually a health and safety issue and you want to um, treat it appropriately, and so you wouldn't want to dust or dislodge anything from that surface, not only for your own health and safety, but to prevent um, kind of mold spores traveling in, throughout the air. Um, if you don't know the materials and manufacturing methods of your object, uh, I wouldn't attempt to do anything to it. I wouldn't attempt to dust it. Uh, and if you're not comfortable with the techniques you're using, um, so if you've never uh, dusted an object before or uh, been trained in how to do it. Some so along those lines, if you are going to undertake dusting, um, you want to test your methods and practice on non-collections objects first. So you never want to do something to an object without being very comfortable with what you're doing. Um, and cleaning does count as a conservation treatment, so uh, testing is a critical part of that process. Um, and then once you do decide to approach an object, you want to test a small area before you undertake a full cleaning. Um, so a lot of people, uh, I've, I've gotten a lot of questions about just cleaning with, with water. Uh, and why not, why not just use a little bit of water on a rag um, to, to clean up an object? Um, so this is actually wet or solvent cleaning. Um, and solvents are uh, a very strong, um, can be very strong cleaning solutions, including water. So, um, you should absolutely never use solvents to clean your objects unless you're working with a conservator. Um, generally, the rule of thumb is like dissolves like. So if you don't understand the chemistry of your object and your surface of your object, you could be in serious trouble. Um, I've uh, thrown in this slide, um, and I actually never encountered this in chemistry class. I didn't encounter this until I was in uh, conservation school, but this is called a tease diagram, and this is just one way um, people have tried to illustrate um, solubility and, and how solvents interact with various forces that keep um, bind things together. And in fact, this is, this is uh, not even um, a generally accepted illustration. It's so complicated that, that people can't even agree on how to illustrate um, the different ways that that solvents interact with themselves and with um, surfaces. So uh, I, I put this slide in just to kind of illustrate the complexity of, of wet treatments. Um, and again, to urge you to never to try to undertake those um, unless you're working with uh, a conservator or in, in consultation with a conservator. Um, and at the bottom of this slide, uh, there's a great article called Solvents and Sensibility. If you do want to get more into the scientific background of solvents and solvent cleaning um, by Krista Brutus and Sharon Blank, and that's available uh, through the AIC website. Um, so solvent cleaning is okay if undertaken by a conservator, but there are products that you should just never, ever, ever use on your collections. Um, so these include silver polishes, Windex, uh, or any kind of commercial glass cleaner, um, detergents and leather dressings. 
So a lot of, uh, again, kind of common knowledge or uh, things you'll hear frequently is that leather objects need to be waxed and maintained um, or dressed with certain saddle soaps or various other products, uh, needs to oil, et cetera. Um, this may be true when objects were out in the world being used regularly, but once something comes into a museum, you don't want to treat your objects with these objects or these materials. Um, compressed air, again, seems very innocuous because you're just using air to, to dislodge material from your object surface, but there are actually accelerants in compressed air uh, that can leak out of the can um, and affect the surface of your object. So that's one to avoid. If you do want to use air, uh, you can actually get little baby nose suction tools. Um, so you can get them at a pharmacy. They're relatively cheap, and those will give you a small amount of air that you can control, and it's purely mechanical. There's no compressed, um, there's no accelerants or um, solvents that could leak out onto your object. So those are a nice tool to have just a little bit of air to help um, clean an object surface. Uh, and then another one you see a lot online uh, is, is using bread to clean the object. So um, this is commonly uh, listed as a treatment for painting, as a way to clean paintings. Um, but again, the, the big problem with all of these things is uh, the residue that is being left behind when you use these materials because they may look clean at the end of a treatment, but you're actually, um, you can be leaving behind chemicals and colorants and plasticizers and things that you don't want to remain on your object that also might change over time in ways that you don't anticipate and don't like. Um, so never ever use these in your collection. Um, be wary. And then again, when you're cleaning, uh, how do you know when, when you should stop uh, cleaning? So through careful observation, so watching what you're doing, um, watching your surface, seeing if, if you're removing loose dust that you're trying to remove, uh, it's nice to take breaks and come back to something if it's a large object um, and just see how it's going and give your eyes a break. Um, if you don't see any more dust coming off of the surface, that's a good indicator that it's time to stop. Uh, definitely stop if you notice any unexpected changes. Uh, that is a sign that uh, you actually have an unstable surface and you don't want to uh, do anything to that object. Um, and then using your common sense and your instincts. So letting um, your good sense be the guide uh, when you're working with materials. And what about other types of treatments? So uh, remedial conservation is super complex. There's no recipe book for treatments. Everything is context-based and should be done um, by professional conservators. Um, they can provide a good idea of the scope of the work that's needed and what might be undertaken in-house. If there are things you can do with your team once you've been trained by a conservator, um, they'll be able to guide you through that process. Uh, and they'll want to have detailed information about the object that you want treated or the work that you want undertaken. So that would include condition reports if you have them, um, high resolution photographs, and kind of a description of both the problem and what your, your goals are. So uh, are you wanting to do treatment for something to go on view? Are you wanting to do treatment for um, because you're worried something's falling apart, or you want to do treatment because something's going on loan and needs to be able to withstand travel. Um, so giving them the full idea of that context is really helpful when you're um, considering uh, reaching out to a conservator for, for treatment advice. Um, another thing that you always need to do when you're dusting collections objects to clean your cleaning supplies, so you'll want to use a, a mild detergent and, and rinse it thoroughly. Um, and just make it a habit every time you, you do collections maintenance. Um, even if you're not working on collections objects, anytime you're cleaning in your galleries, you wanna make sure you're cleaning with clean tools. Um, it's also really, really critical to make sure that the condition information you're collecting um, before you clean an object is attached to your object file in the database or in the object records. Uh, always take photographs uh, of your objects and, and what you're doing. Um, you'll wanna record that you're cleaning. So usually in your um, kind of housekeeping log, you'll wanna note how often you're seeing dust build up and how often you're needing to um, dust your objects. And I like to use that not only as a tool to know how often I should be doing cleaning, but you can really help um, make a case for an object to be either better protected by a vitrine or some other sort of um, 
environmental change or to come off to you if it needs to be maintained uh, and cleaned regularly because it is um, uh, hard on an object to be repeatedly handled in that way. Um, so it's really nice to start to build that case by tracking this sort of material and this sort of information. Um, and so part of your housekeeping plan should include a log where you note down these sorts of uh, undertakings regularly. Okay, so you might uh, dust your object and have it still look dirty. In fact, I think a lot of times you'll dust your object and it will still look dirty. Um, but the goal is not to make it look clean, uh, or should not be to make it look clean, but it, it should be to remove any dust on the surface that might build up over time and create a bigger problem. Um, In-depth cleaning should always be undertaken by a conservator or in consultation with the conservator. Um, it is uh, more difficult and more intensive for the object. Um, but hopefully over time, if you're regularly maintaining your spaces, you won't have to, to do uh, as much remedial conservation. If you do need to work with a conservator, how do you find one? Um, so the American Association, Institute, um, the, excuse me, American Institute for Conservation, uh, the professional organization for conservators here in the States, um, has a great website generally. So it's culturalheritage.org. Um, it's a really good resource to find lots of different information about conservation. Um, they have a lot of good information about collections care. They have uh, different resources available, um, newsletters you can sign up for. Um, they also have a tool to find a conservator in your area. Um, so you can see actually on this screenshot here, the link where it says care for your treasures yourself. There's um, lots of good links to, to um, guidelines about what you can do for your objects on your own. Um, and then they have the find a conservator tool where you can search by location. You can search um, using where you are and how close you want this person to be. You can search by object specialty. So a lot of times you'll want somebody to come in and look at your paintings or your works on paper um, or your three-dimensional objects and you can kind of narrow down that way. Um, or if you have someone in mind or who you've worked with before, you can enter their name and see there. The really nice thing about this tool is that the folks on this webpage are professional conservators um, and they're members in good standing of this organization. Um, so you can feel pretty confident about their skills and abilities. Um, another resource, I, I know that a lot of museums will have lists of local conservators um, and uh, can be a good resource to help point you in the direction of somebody who might be able to help you with your collections um, and your collection spaces. Um, it's important to try and find a conservator um, with an appropriate background. So you want to work with someone who's um, uh, uh, abides by the AIC code of ethics and uses appropriate um, materials and techniques, uh, which is why I like to go to this web page because you know you feel very confident uh, with what you're getting if you find someone through this, this source. Okay, um, so you might have been working through your collection and you've done a bunch of condition reports, um, and you have to think about how to prioritize conservation projects within your collection. Uh, I think it's really easy to fall into the trap of um, allowing your priorities to be driven by external factors. So exhibits, loans, things like that. Um, and obviously that's one component of the decision about priorities. Um, but it's really important to also undertake a systematic review uh, of your collections and start to think about um, priorities, not in terms of use for the object, but also just in terms of their overall condition. Um, and which objects are really critical and kind of balance curatorial um, considerations, object condition considerations, as well as use considerations in, term, in terms of exhibits and loans. Um, trying to find the harmony between all three and balancing those, those considerations uh, really helps you establish good priorities and, and spend your resources in the appropriate way. Um, at the bottom of the slide, I've put, um, kind of a, a ranking system that I like to use when I'm working with objects. Uh, it's a four scale system. I don't ever like to use a scale uh, of rankings that has five points um, because I think people, especially people who might have less experience in determining priorities or determining um, conservation, or I guess, uh, yeah, conservation priority, will tend to stick to the middle option. So I'll always kind of, uh, 
err on the side of not making a decision in terms of low or high and having a four-point scale kind of um, forces people to make a decision is this low priority or is it high priority uh, is it good or is it bad um, and kind of take a stance on your object rather than just falling to the middle ground um, if they're not sure about something um, so I use a four-point scale both for my overall condition and the condition uh, report so um, poor, fair, good, excellent, something like that all oh, works pretty well. And I use a four scale, um, a four point scale for uh, treatment priority. So no treatment priority, no treatment needed, low treatment priority, medium treatment priority, high treatment priority. Uh, and oftentimes these two scales will correlate. Um, so <clears throat> the National Park Service has a really good description of their uh, condition rankings and how um, they think about them, and obviously this will vary institution by institution. Uh, generally for me, um, if an object, if I'm ranking an object excellent, it's usually because it's almost brand new. So uh, it was recently made by the artist um, or somehow acquired in pristine condition. Uh, good uh, as a treatment or good as a, as a condition um, overall ranking uh, for me tends to be something that might show signs of use or signs of age, um, might have some minor aesthetic issues, but doesn't really generally have any structural issues affecting its condition. So nothing um, that are, are structurally risky when you're handling the object. Um, fair objects may have some structural issues, uh, but nothing um, super critical or imminent kind of deterioration or might have ongoing structural uh, concerns, but nothing um, kind of dire, and then poor is something that's really critical, uh, has significant structural issues or uh, increasing ongoing deterioration. So similarly, not always, but these four points tend to correlate um, with those those four reasons. So um, in terms of condition only, if something is in poor shape, it's probably a high treatment priority. Um, just in terms of condition, however, that object might be uh, a low priority curatorially. And so when you're creating the picture for your organization of, of conservation and creating a conservation plan, you'll need to kind of uh, balance those two considerations um, through conversations with your curators and through establishing uh, rankings not only for condition but for curatorial importance. Um, and, then, and then use. So if this object is on view frequently, if it travels frequently, um, that also kind of is a factor in little bit. Um, so condition surveys are a great way to start creating your conservation plan um, for your whole collection. And these can be um, super simple or super complex. So you can do condition surveys that uh, look at your object or look at your collection on an object by object basis. Um, so these are, are obviously very time intensive. Um, especially if you have a large collection and are, are usually long-term projects. Um, you can have conditions and surveys that focus on a subset of your collection. So this example on the screen here uh, was a specific project for through a grant to look at um, just the metal objects from, from the collection of the Oriental Institute Museum. And so this was really a, a condition survey form that was tailored to metal objects um, and designed to be relatively quick because it was a, a you know a shorter grant time frame, um, but was still an object by object survey just in the metal, uh, metal objects in the collection. Um, you might have a sample survey. So you might want to do a, a faster survey that looks at a smaller subset of your collection. So you might want to look at um, one of 10 objects. Uh, see this if there are any red flags or any areas where you know you have issues, uh, and you might, you know, uh, a significant problem when you have a section of your storage area that has mold growth that you didn't know about, or uh, your metal objects are deteriorating faster, or um, something like that. And <clears throat> sample surveys are nice because they are faster and they also can point to um, environmental conditions that you can address. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so they, they can help you figure out. Uh, if you have environmental conditions um, that you can change and kind of uh, 
focus there rather than, than focus on your object. Um, they might flag up areas where it's, it's kind of gone further than that and you want to bring in um, conservators for further treatment, but it's really nice uh, to do a condition survey. Uh, also, if you're going to apply for further grant funding for treatment. So um, it's a really great tool in a grant application to say we've undertaken a condition survey and we know um, that this is a priority in our collection, and this is a priority for treatment um, because we have a good idea of the, the whole picture. Um, they're a really great tool to kind of to develop that that bigger picture. Uh, it's really great too if they go hand in hand with um, curatorial review, um, because then you can can again develop the whole uh, picture for your collection and your organization, not just for your uh, collections as a collection person. Um, and there are a couple of, of surveys that can help kind of, again, with the bigger picture thing that are sponsored by different national organizations. So the Collections Assessment for Preservation uh, is a program run by the IMLS, uh, Institute for Museum and Library Services. Um, and what this does is it has a couple of assessors come in and they look at your collections um, over the course of a couple of days and they make big recommendations for goals for your organization. So they, um, they look at your environmental considerations, they look at your storage considerations, and they kind of can help you develop a long-term big picture plan. Uh, same things with the Museum Assessment Program, um, and that's less specific to collections and kind of a, a broader big picture, um, but they're both really helpful in then being a launching point for, for other grants or other kind of long-term planning. Um, I've also included the CCAHA's website, um, so surveys are something that you can hire conservators to come in and do and help you with um, consultation. Uh, and here from the CCAHA website is kind of some of, some of the, the sorts of things that they do and are similar to lots of different um, independent conservators uh, in terms of assessments and surveys that, that you can get help with. Um, and it's really nice sometimes to have someone come in and be able to do this for you, uh, to focus on it and to um, kind of undertake the planning and structural organization uh, for you. Um, and again, these are all uh, tools to help you create your conservation plan and to create your collections management plan and um, to guide your work over a course of several years. So they're not um, individual treatments per se, but they are long range planning tools and uh, really important when you are kind of creating your overarching goals. Um, Uh, okay. um, so there are also resources available not only for these sorts of assessment projects, but for individual conservation treatments and projects. Um, again, so IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, they run the CAP program, um, and then they run uh, several other programs that have um, funding available for, for conservation projects. Um, you will need uh, for these projects, we'll need to have um, treatment proposals, treatment plans, and kind of um, evidence that you've worked with the conservator. So you'll you'll want to, um, if you're thinking about applying for one of these, you'll probably work in conjunction with a conservator to at least develop the uh, estimates and kind of range scope of treatment. Um, National Endowment for the Arts has has one uh, grant that's really great for conservation projects, um, and and these grants will also fund surveys. So they'll fund treatments, but they'll also fund surveys, which is great um, because then you can kind of piggyback off of that survey work to then fund future treatments. Um, the National Endowment for the Humanities has some grants. The Crest Foundation has some great grants. So Crest Foundation, though, is focused on European art of the pre-modern era. So there are some collection um, limitations on that grant itself. Uh, but all of these resources, um, are, are useful in terms of funding projects that might otherwise be prohibitively expensive. Uh, and again, the American Institute for Conservation, culturalheritage.org has some other resources listed on their good go to to start thinking about these sorts of projects. Um, okay, I've listed a lot of resources on this page, um, but the top one is American Institute for Conservation, so culturalheritage.org, mentioned that several times. Uh, and they have uh, a group called Connecting to Collections Care, um, which hosts webinars and informational um, 
sessions online, and they also have a lot of great resources available um, for thinking about collections, care, and conservation. Uh, ARCS is another good one, uh, Association for Registrars and Collection Specialists. If you are kind of delving in uh, and attempting to work on objects, um, the Canadian Conservation Institute notes and the National Park Service Conserver Grants are super helpful. Uh, they even have guidelines on things like picking tools uh, for environmental monitoring or uh, picking a kind of a good um, data loggers or vacuums, things like that. Uh, you might not expect to be available, but they are super useful and um, available through those two kind of bulletins. Um, there is a great website on the agents of deterioration um, that's on this list. Uh, and again, National Park Service Museum Handbook. Um, this is a good tool too when you're setting up your condition reporting or thinking about condition reports because it does go through uh, a lot of terminology that is used and a lot of different things you can think about. Um, and when you're creating these definitions and these structures in place, uh, and getting these structures in place for working with your collections and, and analyzing and thinking through your collections. Um, the Storage of Natural History Collections, Friend of Conservation Approach, there's actually a newer version of this book, I think that was recently brought out uh, by Spinach and a bunch of other organizations. Um, and so the Society for Preservation of Natural History Collections, the next link, so they have the most uh, up-to-date resource. And that, again, is um, really good when you're thinking through how to mitigate issues through preventive conservation and uh, trying to avoid any kind of remedial conservation. Um, and then we talked about the basic condition reporting book and the National Trust Manual of Housekeeping is really interesting because um, it actually talks a lot about uh, kind of traditional housekeeping techniques that are really uh, useful in collections work that you might not consider as a uh, museum organization. Um, so a lot of the constraints that they have working in historic houses, you know, things like windows and um, covering furnishings and light levels, uh, there are traditional techniques that they can use really effectively to mitigate some of these concerns um, and might not be uh, something you'd think of off the bat. So I really like that resource when I'm thinking about housekeeping or um, how to kind of care for my collection uh, if I can't affect my building in a way that I might like to. Um, they've, had, they've developed some good workarounds um, if you can't change, you know, can't change the window in your building. How can you work around it rather than trying to um, make big changes that are not always uh, financially possible or um, even popular amongst your organization? I don't know that uh, everyone would be on board if you wanted to close up all the windows, although it would be great for your objects, um, not having natural light coming into your museum. Um, so I like that as a resource to kind of think through uh, other options and to also kind of Again, it goes through some basic kind of collections care uh, principles and, and things you can do with your objects. Um, okay, but the key, key things I, I really wanna have you guys take away from today is that preventive conservation is your probably most cost-effective um, way to care for your collections and to prevent deterioration. Uh, and it's also minimally impactful. Um, Probably you've all heard of the kind of tenet of reversibility in conservation. So the idea that anything you do to an object should be possible to undo. So you should be able to reverse any treatment that's done. Um, and that is a great thing to strive for and it's not a realistic thing to achieve. Um, so for example, cleaning. So you're removing material from a surface that will never go back to that object surface. So it's not, um, entirely reversible, but minimally impactful is a really uh, great way to think about, um, to, to think about caring for your, your collection. So it, the, the things that you can do will have the most benefit with the least impact on your actual object. Uh, and preventive conservation really is a wonderful tool for that. So thinking through your collection spaces, your uh, environmental conditions, the materials you're using, and um, the way you're displaying and storing your objects um, can, can hopefully provide you some insight and a way to kind of um, care for your objects without actually having to do anything to them. 
Uh, and then routine maintenance. So we talked about housekeeping a lot. Housekeeping is uh, an important part of um, collections management, and it should be something that is standard in, in your institution and uh, documented and actually done. Um, again, removing the sources of uh, deterioration, removing um, the pollutants, the dust particles, or they have a chance to affect your object uh, is a great way to not have to bring in a conservator. Um, but if you do have to bring in a conservator, uh, or if you need to dust your objects yourself, um, you should only do it after you kind of carefully observe and consider your objects. So remember your, uh, remember the questions to go through before you work with an object, um, question your motives and your, your intended outcomes, um, and then document document your object before, document your, your methods and materials, and then document your object um, at the end, and then make sure that you are keeping that documentation and uh, tracking it with your object record. So in your object file, in your database, um, making sure that object is stored and as consistent as it can be uh, in order to make, make it useful for everybody in the future. Um, so at this point, I'd like to have people uh, if you have questions, um, you can put them in the chat box, and I will pay attention to the chat box. Now, are there any questions? You're welcome. Um, if anybody does have any questions, I can surely do that. Um, I can provide a PDF of a sample condition survey. Uh, Leah or Stephanie, is it easier for me to give that to you to um, disseminate or to have people email me? What's the best way? Anybody there? Um, Autumn, I will get back to you on that in terms of providing a sample condition survey. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, um, I know it's a bit early, but I think we will leave it there. Um, thank you guys so much for, for listening and uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me uh, if there's anything I can answer for you um, or if you have any other questions or uh, things that you're curious about. Um, I did wanna mention that Winterter also has a really great website and I should put that on the resource list, but um, Winterter has a good kind of guidelines for caring for your collections and cleaning collections objects. So if that's something you're considering or something you want to do, I would um, reach out or I would go online and check out Winterter's um, kind of advice. Uh, yeah, and I guess if that's it, I want to say thank you to everyone for listening. And um, and yeah, I will. Uh, um, I'm glad you're here with me. All right, thank you.